Hi everyone, welcome back to another Q&A video where I'll be asking, where I'll be answering rather your questions. And this time I'm actually including all of my subscribers. So I'll be answering all of your questions, and not just my patrons. Although of course, as always, my patrons will be getting uh, the priority here. So I will be answering their questions first. And then because I got so many questions on my last post, I won't be able to answer all of them, obviously. So I'll pick a few ones out and I'll do my best to answer them for you. Now, before we start, I would just like to say that amazingly, this channel has grown quite a bit recently. We, just a few weeks ago, reached 10,000 subscribers, and before I even had time to blink or make a video thanking you for that, suddenly we're now at 25,000 subscribers. That's just absolutely amazing. I'm very humbled and thankful that so many of you seem to be enjoying the content, that you are maybe spreading the content, that you um, support me in various ways. Uh, especially, of course, I would like to thank my patrons who support me over on Patreon. This is, as I've said in most of my videos, this is really what's keeping this channel going. Um, you know, I'm working a full-time job, I'm doing these videos at the same time, I have a bunch of other projects, so this is, of course, very time-consuming, even though it is something that I'm very passionate about, but the fact that you guys support me so that I am able to buy the books for research or to all kinds of different things that I need to make these videos, that is just incredible to me that you uh, choose to support me and I'm, I'm very humbled and so thankful for that. So thank you everyone for getting us to this place and I look forward to um, keep making videos and, and keep growing this channel as we go forward. So as I said, I'll begin by answering the questions asked by my patrons. So first of all, uh, Yasir Khan asks, which, or which thinker, philosopher, Sufi, or religious figure that you have come across in your studies inspires you most? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I mean, most of them inspire me in some way, I guess. A lot of these people are inspiring in a lot of ways. None of them are perfect, of course. There is not a single person I think is you know, the, the perfect person to, to emulate in any way. I don't know, really. Who do I admire the most? I think I've been asked this question before, like, which philosopher do I like the most? And I really don't have an answer for that. I, I tend to like philosophers who um, do, you know, put a lot of weight to reason and, and, and rationality. I am quite a sort of... Personally, I'm a person who relies a lot on, on reason and logic, but I am also the kind of person who, who is very adamant to recognize the limits of our intellect and of reason, and so I guess I tend to sympathize with the philosophers who do put an emphasis on reason, but to a degree, and then sort of agree that, well, after that, something else will have to, to take over. Um, you know, philosophers like you know, Ibn Tufail or Ibn Sabain are examples of those kinds of philosophers. I think generally people, I'm, I'm not so much inspired or, or impressed by people's intelligence or how complex their metaphysics are. Usually, I think what inspires me and what I admire the most in people historically or today is is, is rather what kind of a person they are in terms of uh, you know, if they're kind, loving, if they're humble, so these kinds of things. So I don't know if I can just come up with someone off the top of my head, but people in history or today that showcases humbleness and kindness and a sort of loving attitude towards fellow human beings and uh, other creatures generally, those are the people that inspire me the most. Okay, Hanan Fikri asks, according to Wahdat al-Wujud, is creation an extension of God? If not, then does that mean that creation always existed with the existence of God? Uh, saying that it's an extension of God seems to imply that it's somehow part of God, and this is not what Wahdat al-Wujud teaches, or at least not what Ibn Arabi teaches. Um, to him, the world or creation is a manifestation of God. It's a manifestation of his divine attributes, like a mirror, but it's also, uh, they take their 
existence from God's existence. So it's, that's the relationship that it has, that these two have, God and the world. Um, it's not so much that it is a part of the world, like a part of God's body or something like that. That's that's uh, that's not how Wahdat uh, al-Wujud should be understood. Um, and when it comes to the eternity of the world, uh, Ibn Arabi was not in favor of the idea of the world's eternity. Um, you know, some of those who have been fans of Ibn Arabi, who have been who have ascribed to the idea of Wahdat al-Wujud, has um, interpreted it in a way that allows for the eternity of the world. But generally, I think that school does not um, tend to hold this idea. The eternity of the world is more commonly found in some of the uh, peripatetic philosophers like Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd, Al-Farabi, uh, who would often indeed argue that the world was eternal with God, and yet that he was the creator of them. Ibn Sina uses a lot of great allegories to explain how this works, but in terms of Bahdat al-Wujud, no, that's, I would not say that this is the case. Okay, Mikhail Stankiewicz asks, maybe you could say something about trends in religious studies, and which ones inspire the most, stuff like Eliad, everything is connected and the opposite views, which ones were significantly more present in your university education than others? Uh, so the place I studied was is a university called Södertörn University in Stockholm, Sweden, and the program there, uh, the culture there is sort of very inspired by say, post-modernist thinking, as well as a lot of post-colonial uh, theories, post-orientalist attitudes. Um, and so because I'm taught in that environment, uh, I have a lot of that stuff in me, obviously. It's funny when people accuse uh, me and many others of being orientalist. I think I feel like people use the word orientalist so much as a critique that it has lost all its meaning. A lot of what we do, where I come from, is to actually study the orientalists, which would be the old sort of colonial... Um, scholars who often had an incredibly biased view of the Middle East and a huge part of the studies of religion today where I come from is to look at those scholars and try to undo what they have messed up in the past. Um, so orientalist for us too is a very negative term and something that we basically strive very hard to go against. And so when people keep calling me and others orientalists just because we are, I don't know, because we're scholars from the West um, or white scholars or white scholars who those people particularly don't agree with on a certain subject, then we're all orientalists. Um, in any case, um, there's a lot of stuff that we about the kind of culture where I, my educational um, context. Um, I've always been a fan of the more sociological perspectives on religion, you know, Durkheim and his kind of school. Religion is primarily a, a social phenomenon. It's about, uh, you know, group belonging, about, about uh, personal identity and things like this. But there's a lot of really fascinating stuff, <clears throat> or research being done also about uh, psychological uh, theories on religion, like um, cognitive behavioral theories about how that affects our view of the world and why we believe in gods and things like this. So there's a lot going on. I think all of them have uh, great things to teach and take a lot of, of, of good ideas from different theories and different schools. And I think that was one of the things that that my educational circumstances were very good for, which was that we, of course, study all different kinds of theories and perspectives on religion, you know, academically. Um, so it, it's been a it's been a melting pot of a lot of different things. Dan Hill says, uh, "I see you've covered coffee. I wonder if it would be appropriate to discuss cannabis." Yes, it's always appropriate to discuss cannabis. Um, uh, on a serious note, I think. Um, this is, of course, something that uh, there's a lot to be said about, and I will be tackling this in the future. I think I got some other question from uh, a subscriber also about talking about the use of psychedelics in Sufism, for example. <clears throat> so, so yeah, I will probably be, be tackling that subject uh, pretty soon, uh, I hope. Lastly, from my patron team is uh, Matija Kurbanovic, excuse the pronunciation. Do you plan to cover the, is it bone or burn religion one day? Uh, 
I'll be honest, my knowledge about this religion is very limited. I have even had to Google it right now to, you know, of course I've heard of it, but I had to Google it to remember what it actually was. Um, even though, you know, as a, you know, I hate that word, but as a scholar of religions, I obviously I don't know everything. And this is definitely a, a gap in, in, my, in my knowledge. But that's a good thing because that just means I have a lot of fascinating research ahead of me. So yes, I would love to cover that at some point. Okay, so questions from my regular subscribers. Um, number one, from Fatima Safa, studying what religion had the most impact on your life. I don't think any of them had a more of an impact on my life than any other. Um, I've studied Islam and Sufism more than other religions, so maybe just by that fact that has had a huge impact on me. But other than that, I don't think there is one who, you know, has impacted me more than any other, really. Okay, Safe King 35 asks, what religion do you practice? And this is, of course, one of the most um, frequently asked questions. What religion do I belong to? What do I believe in? Am I a Muslim? <laughs> um, no, uh, first of all, no, I'm not a Muslim. Um, what religion do I practice? Uh, I, and what religion do I belong to? I might as well answer all these questions at the same time. I, I, I consider myself culturally to be Christian, but I don't necessarily adhere to the um, theological doctrines of the Trinity and these things. So on that basis, maybe I wouldn't be considered a Christian uh, by many. Other than that, I don't really adhere to any specific religion at all at the moment. I've said previously that I, I do believe in God. Um, it depends, of course, on how you define God. But generally, when people ask me, do you believe in God, I'll say yes. Uh, and and I, I do have a way of relating to that. I do have a way of practicing, but it's not related to any specific religion in that sense. Not at the moment. Who knows where life takes you, right? But right now, I don't belong to any specific religion in that sense. So here's another very common question, one of the most frequently, ask, answered, uh, most frequently asked questions um, in this uh, post, which is, what do you think of the perennial philosophy and such figures as René Guénon and Fritzschoff Schuon? Uh, many people asked questions uh, relating to this. So the perennial philosophy or the perennial school is a school of, of philosophy that emerged uh, for the most part in the 20th century and is associated with these thinkers that he mentioned, René Guénon and Fritjof Schuon, also Said Hossein Nasser and, and many others. Uh, very influential, of course, especially in scholarship about Sufism. They have been very prominent as, as some of the greatest and most successful scholars and writers about Sufi topics. <clears throat> and the perennial philosophy is basically this idea that um, many of the world's religions, like well, Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, has certain core features um, or essential features that are the same, even though they're expressed in different languages. That's a very simplified way of explaining it, but, but that's the sort of perennial idea, this idea of a perennial wisdom throughout the world's religions. Um, <clears throat> I think they have certainly, they have some very interesting ideas. I am, you know, my academic side is a little skeptical because I think of course, we can find a lot of similarities between religions, but there are also a lot of differences. Just like, you know, the theories of um, Carl Jung or some of his people from his school also tends to often, I think, simplify things to a large degree and, and connect certain traditions and ideas from different cultures that aren't necessarily the same thing, but they only become the same thing in the mind of the person who is theorizing about it. But, you know, at the same time, I have a lot of perennial tendencies myself. You know, when I talk about Ibn Arabi and Meister Eckhart and Adi Shankara and the Taoist writers, like there's a, you know, you, you, there, it's hard to deny that some of the things they say are just fascinatingly similar to each other and that there are certain features of these different religions that sometimes seem to be completely unconnected to each other that have these very strong features and similarities to them. Um, 
And I am endlessly fascinated by that stuff too. And I love to talk about why that may be. Why is Ibn Arabi and Meister Eckhart so similar? Is it because of a common influence from Neoplatonism, for example? Or is it some common human experience that they're both trying to grab at? I, I don't know, obviously, but I think it's just so fascinating to, to think about. When it comes to the idea of the perennial philosophy, this is something that I will be talking about more. Uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'm planning on making videos on that in the future, so I'll be talking about that more deeply later on, so I'll keep this pretty short now. But yeah, so you can look forward to me talking about that more in the future. Okay, Ahmed BD asks, which religion impressed you the most? Uh, no in religion has really impressed me more than any other. Dortoka says, outside of YouTube and learning, what are your favorite hobbies? Well, I do, I am a musician, so I play music. Um, that's a huge part of my identity, I guess. I That was my primar primary occupation, or, well, primary activity before this channel started to gain some traction, so to say. Um, and that's still a huge part of my life. I have a lot of different hobbies and interests. I also studied film for a while, which is very helpful when I make these YouTube videos. Um, just arts and culture, uh, culture generally is something that always fascinates me. So, you know, even though I'm not good at it, you know, I love visual art, like painting, uh, poetry. Again, this is not something that I do myself, but I very much enjoy uh, that, watching movies. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I've never been into sports or cars, but other than that, like, I, I'm basically interested in, in anything that you, you know, put in front of me. Uh, Benali Badr asks, did Sufis ever use psychedelics? Probably. Uh, there, there are evidence, uh, or, you know, it, it's pretty well known that many Sufis historically used substances like, well, cannabis, for example, uh, and opium. I haven't heard any direct references to, you know, mushrooms or things like that. It depends on what you count as psychedelics, but certainly um, cannabis and opium and things like this have been consumed by Sufis as a way to help them in their spiritual practices. We know this, for example, because of people, we'll say, for example, uh, the founder of the Numatullahi Sufi order, Shah Nimatullah Wali, He's famous f for one of the things that he taught was that he told his students to not or to stop smoking um, cannabis, right? So this tells us that well, there were Sufis who did because otherwise he wouldn't have to tell them not to. So yes, there are there are evidence that this is something that took place. Ali Ram asks, "What videos are you planning to do next for the two for the for the next two months? Would you consider traveling to places to study more about the topics you made videos about?" Um, I have uh, different things planned. I'm working on a video about Meister Eckhart, which is a great uh, Christian theologian and mystic of the Middle Ages. I am also planning to do one on Abu Lafia, which is a Jewish uh, Kabbalist and mystic. Also, um, I am working on some stuff on Islamic occultism and magic. I am doing some more on Hinduism, uh, delving into some of those schools that I talked about in the last video. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of different ideas, but those are some of the ones that I'm working on currently. Matthias uh, oh, um, Greziak, excuse me, asks, what religious or philosophical text is dearest to you? Why do you always ask me to take sides like this? I don't, I don't know. There is a lot of beauty and wisdom in so many of these texts. Um, I think I revealed the secret that I very much love the text uh, called Dronze, which is a Taoist text. Uh, I've always just absolutely loved that one. I, there are certain books of the Bible that I'm very fond of. I love the book of Job. Um, I also love the book of Ecclesiastes, for example. Um, there are certain surahs in the Quran that are absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff. Um, those are the ones that are just at the top of my head that I can think about, but I, I see value in most of those kinds of texts. There's always something to be learned or to, to, to be inspired by, I think, when you read these old uh, texts. I think they have survived for so long as important texts for a reason. Um, and so 
for that reason alone, there is usually something in there to 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 learn from. Issa Haddad asks I, or says, I appreciate that you share the original Arabic terms for many topics and your pronunciations are quite good. Thank you very much. Um, do you speak Arabic fluently? Um, no, I wouldn't say fluently, um, but I have studied Arabic officially at university for a year, which of course is nothing when it comes to Arabic, but it's enough that I have uh, a general grasp of the, the grammar and the basics of the language. I can read and write and speak Arabic, but not to the degree that I would be able to hold a conversation with someone, for example, and I basically only know fusha, which is classical or modern standard Arabic, and not really any of the dialects, and a little Iraqi dialect because my wife's family is from Iraq, but other than that, I know. Um, so I, I, I want to, of course, increase my knowledge in Arabic, but that's where I stand at the moment. Okay, Muhammad Suhermanto asks, you seem like always have a superb list of sources to dig deeper before uh, the video making. How do you choose your sources to learn uh, primarily read? Um, so a few people have asked this question too, where do I get my sources from? Um, so my criterion for sources is that they are scholarly sources, so that they are scientific sources, you know, peer-reviewed uh, academic sources. So I get a lot of the kind of comments that will say that, you know, I should be you know, why am I using Western scholars as, you know, sources and not Muslim scholars or Islamic scholars? It's not that I'm not using Islamic scholars. If you look through uh, these sources, there's always a list, to begin with, there is always a list of sources in the descriptions of my videos. If you want to uh, see where I get my sources from, or you want to, you know, find uh, things to read yourself. Um, but I also, also see a lot of people criticizing that I use non-Muslim sources. Um, that's not necessarily the case. A lot of the sources I use is by Muslims. Um, the fact that they're Muslim or not does not make a difference to me. The difference is if they're scholarly, if they're scientific, if they're academic, if they are, you know, objective, at least as objective as possible. Um, that they are operating from within an academic um, context, uh, which makes them scientifically reliable. I am not interested in using polemical texts as sources. You know, um, certain of my videos I made on, on Shia Islam or Ibadi Islam, people have said that I should, you know, look into uh, Islamic sources and what they say. But, you know, if I were to only look at Sunni sources for describing Shia Islam, that would be ridiculous. I do take sources from many different places. If I'm writing about a certain philosopher or person, I'll always try to read their own words if I am if I want to represent them properly. Um, and if I'm writing about a certain religious group, I'll try to get the perspective of that religious group, um, but not necessarily from groups who are critical of them. Um, that, so my, when I made my video on Manichaeism, for example, I did not rely on Christian sources, or, you know, as in like medieval uh, polemical Christian sources or Muslim sources, because honestly, they are usually not reliable because they're polemical, they're critical. Uh, so it's much better to rely on, uh, you know, sources from inside that tradition itself or from you know, academic, scholarly, scientific sources. Jennifer Grove asks, how many different traditions did the Platonic philosophy get around to influencing and when? Oh boy. Um, you know, Platonism, obviously, one of the most, probably the most, well, at least one of the most influential philosophical schools of all time. There is this saying that um, all philosophy, all, well, all Western philosophy, problematic term of course, but this is how the saying goes, all Western philosophy are basically footnotes to Plato. And there is something to that statement, because Plato is such a foundational figure for all of the traditions that follow to some degree, who were either followers of him or at least commented on him to some degree. Um, Platonism is a hugely important for some of the world's major religions, Christianity, Islam, uh, also certain forms of Judaism and, and many others. Uh, like central ideas in these religions, like the fact that there's a soul, like this soul that is separate from the body. Very 
Platonic idea. So the influence of Plato can really not be overstated. Uh, when? Well, all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, Plato, very, very influential. Abdurrahman Shokri asks, why are you hiding your beliefs while you are doing a channel about religions? I think we have to know from which perspective you are viewing uh, other religions. I, I don't think I'm hiding my beliefs. You know, maybe they just don't shine through that much. I, I always try to keep the content on this channel as unbiased as possible, as objective as possible. Now, you know, I also recognize that it's impossible to be completely objective. It's impossible to be completely uh, unbiased. My personal views, whatever they may be on a subject, will always shine through in some way. So when I talk about a subject, you'll probably notice in some way if I'm excited about it or not, for example. But I don't think I hide my religious identity. I've already talked about in this video that I, I don't really you know, ascribe very much to a certain religious identity. Uh, consciously so, uh, and so it's not something that I consciously hide, it's just that this is the way I've been also taught to talk about religions from this unbiased and, and academic perspective, and that's what I do at, on this channel, this is not a religious channel, I am not, uh, a, a, you know, I'm not a religious scholar, I'm a scholar of religion, there's a difference there, right? So I'm not here to to talk about who is right or who is wrong or what religion is better than some other religion. I'm just here to talk about religions as they are uh, from an academic perspective. Well, that's, that's the purpose of this channel, to not let those things affect what I say the most. What I think what, uh, what, what annoys me with this kind of question, you know, I'm not I know it with you specifically, of course, but this, this seems to be this underlying uh, feeling that when people ask me, are you Muslim, or what perspective do you view this from, it's like they're trying to check if they can trust me, right? Well, they need to, they need to know which perspective I am talking from, so they can know that, you know, if they agree with that perspective, they can know if they can, you know, trust me or not, if my knowledge is, is worth listening to. And so I think that's not the way I like to look at things. I'd like to examine ideas as they are, of course, people's opinions and perspectives are going to play a part in that. And I get the idea that knowing what perspective a certain person is talking from is um, helpful. And we try to do this as much as possible as academics as well, at least in the modern or postmodern perspective. That's part, partly what I think that whole thing is about, is to be self-reflexive, to, to realize that our personal biases and personal uh, opinions and stances on things, my background, my nationality, my upbringing, everything will affect what I do academically, if I'm doing a, I'm writing a paper, I'm doing some research product, or if I'm doing a YouTube video, my personal opinions are always going to uh, be there. They can't be completely just shoved under the rug. That's that's impossible. That's the mistake that a lot of the you know scholars of the earlier twentieth century made, for example. And what we try to do today is to be. Um, self-conscious about our background and our biases and be open about them and try to see, you know, how do these influence our research and what can we do about it. So if it seems to you that I am hiding my religious identity or my beliefs, then I guess I am not doing my job properly in a way, because I think that's important for us to be transparent, even as academics. Um, but that it's not something I do consciously at all. I think that's just a natural result of my sort of very neutral stance on, on, on this subject generally. DC asks, does religion justify preeminent violence? Which religion? Um, no, yes and no. I mean, look, as I said in my videos about um, essentialism, Religions don't really do anything, or, you know, it's people who do things. Uh, and there are always different people in different religions. So when it comes to things like, you know, violence, does religion support violence? Does Christianity support violence? Do Islam support violence? No. Yes and no. Um, but the religion itself doesn't. It's the people who do. Certain Christians do, certain Christians don't, for example. So to say something that generalizing about just a religion, I think, is, is, is um, unhelpful. Um, so, yeah, that's my 
sort of cop out answer for that question. So last question for today. Pat Rao asks, what will you see what do you see the future of religion being? Will it continue to fade away generation after generation, or will it forever be part of human identity? Um, I, you know, it depends on how you define religion. Generally, I don't think religion's going anytime, anywhere, anytime soon. Um, you know, the research shows that, in one sense, religion is declining. At least it was a couple of decades ago. But what that means is that the big religious institutions, like, you know, the, the Christian church and, and, you know, the big religions, right, are to some degree decreasing in, in numbers and popularity, that the this group called the nuns, that is non-affiliated, is one of the fastest rising groups of our demographics in the world today. Um, but at the same time, that does not mean that people have stopped believing in things associated with religious beliefs, believing in an afterlife, in God or gods, um, magic, or, or any of these things, right? And of course, a lot of new religious movements uh, are also becoming increasingly popular. So um, even though maybe some of the big religions, or I think, let's put it like this, I think m it's possible that religion as we know it is changing, or that re religion as we know it might be decreasing in popularity. It's not going to go away anytime soon at all. Um, but that what that means is that it's only going to take new forms. I think it is some kind of human traits, some kind of human, uh, maybe not need, but, uh, but it's a very human thing um, to have these kinds of things, have these beliefs, have these rituals, and to relate to the world or the universe and our fellow men in a kind of structured and, and organized way, as a religion often offers. So I think I don't think religion, uh, defined in a broad sense, is going anywhere. I think that's very much something that is part of human nature that will stay that way. But that maybe, you know, the, relig the big religions, or religions as we know it, might um, not be as prominent in the future as they are now. But that's very hard to say, because a lot of other research also shows that religion has become more popular and more prominent in society in the last few decades. So I don't know. I think these things fluctuate a lot. We'll see. You know, I'll, maybe, I'll probably make some videos on a subject like this when I'm more prepared to talk about it, more, more fully researched. So that was the last question. Uh, thank you all so much for asking your question. This was a lot of fun. I'd love to do this more in the future. I know there was one question or one person asked when am I when am I doing a live stream Q&A I don't know uh, that sounds like a fun idea I would love to do some live streams in the future um, I'll just have to you know make some time for it because right now my my schedule is quite f packed uh, but yeah, that's also something I'm looking forward to doing in the future. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the comments. And thank you all so much again for your support and for subscribing and for getting this channel to, what is it now, 25,000 subscribers? It's, uh, yeah, that's just crazy. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, I'll see you next time.